you know, I could go through this and be like on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast and go through your many credits. We, we uh-huh. can go on forever and ever and ever. That would take up like a, a half hour. Yeah, so. you don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you go on his podcast. Yeah, just, I would always say, be prepared. It's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the latest thing is, is your book. And uh, what inspired this? It uh, just looks really fascinating, very entertaining. It's called the, the Real True Hollywood Story of Jackie Gold. Yes. So um, I had the little germ of an idea for this book many years ago. Um, it was while I was uh, doing a series called Empty Nest, and this is all pre-cell phones, pre-internet, pre-TMZ, when the tabloids ruled the town Oh yeah. in terms of gossip. And at that same time, the tragedy with Princess Diana happened, where the paparazzi followed her car, and she had that accident and died. Yeah, and yeah. Soon after that, I had had my first child, and a tabloid reporter from the Inquirer showed up at my front door and wanted to ask me very personal questions about my child and paternity, and with all the strength of the new mother bear that I had become, I chased him off my property. Oh, wow. So, you know, up until then, the tabloids to me were like harmless, you know, silly. I mean, they they would write the silliest things like, you know, I I resented the dog on the show because he got more attention than me. I mean, it was stuff that you would laugh over, but this was no laughing matter. And so, you know, I had this germ of an idea about writing about a really big star who is pursued by the paparazzi almost to her death. And um, and my character, Jackie Gold, tells her story from the hospital bed where she's lying in a coma, right. having jumped off a balcony, hotel balcony, to escape the paparazzi. And so the story goes back and forth between the drama and the comedy unfolding in the hospital while she's fighting for her life and people are coming in thinking she doesn't hear a word they say and revealing themselves. And she's uh, telling her life story in flashbacks um, of who she is and how she got to be where she is. And so, you know, I started this book in a workshop way, way, way many years ago, and I didn't know how to write a novel then. So this novel has been my education um, in writing fiction. And the last two years, you know, with COVID, I sent it out to independent publishers and I got the fabulous Myra Fialco from Star Alley. And Good. the rest is history. Isn't that the longest answer you ever got to anything? <laughs> oh my God, I kept thinking to myself, when will I shut up? <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. Because, yeah, I'm really curious because it's just, it's so tight and so entertaining. And it's like, obviously, you have a lot of experience with this. And that's what really sets, and you can almost visualize it. Of course, this could be adapted into some type of a, a film or even, a, you know, it could be even like a mis- musical in a certain way, too. Um, never thought, I never thought of the musical, but I have to say. <laughs> The actress lying in bed in a coma singing is not appealing to me. <laughs> you just never know. The, the irony but there. But you never just... know. <laughs> it seems like everything's a musical now, right? <laughs> oh, my God. I just read the reviews of uh, Diana. Oof. Wow. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, couldn't you see that coming? I mean, I just have to say. Oh, yeah. Couldn't you yeah. see that coming? Totally. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know how the business is. It's like if, if it works and you see how big executives probably uh, savor, you know, oh, my gosh, this is going to just make so much money. We'll just do anything we can. You know, how many sequels, how many musicals can we do and milk it? I don't know. I would think in that case somebody's best friend should have turned to them and said, honey, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on from that. Yeah. <laughs> so in the book, you set the book in 1999, is that right? And the yeah, 
it starts in ninety nine with the um with the accident. But right. Jackie's flashbacks go as far back as the sixties, not to her life, but to her mother's and her father's, and you know why they were who they were, and um, how she came into being. And you know, my favorite part of writing this book was the backstory because. Um, those were the areas her childhood came so easily to me writing about Hollywood and acting is, you know, I had to dig deeper, not to be superficial because Hollywood is superficial. Yes. You know I mean? Oh, I mean, yeah. It is, you know, it, it is get ready, get on the set, get on camera. And that's, that's boring. And so, um, so the backstory was, was, uh, juicy. For me, especially because I shared a childhood with her. You know, while I don't share Jackie's story, I do share elements of her being. And writing about growing up in Malibu Colony in the in the seventies, you know, was really fun for me because that's that's texture, and and it's something so unique. It's so unique oh, that yeah. we have a face. We have a Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, of those of us <laughs> who wow. grew up in the colony in that era because it was such an unusual time. It was way before the time of like Tom Hanks getting a big, you know, mansion there. It was when it was just a bunch of beach shacks and it was after summer homes and 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 some in, in to some degree middle class families. Yeah, so, that's, that wasn't Malibu. That's true. I had some cousins yeah. out there. They grew up in Canoga Park. I remember visiting. Yeah, yeah, early. I know it all. Yeah, yeah. it's my st- old stomping grounds. Yeah, so so I loved writing about that, and um, I don't even remember what the question was. You asked me. <laughs> yeah, just how the the book started in 1999, and all these people are making right. confessions, and you know, then you learn so much when you're in a coma, but you could hear everybody. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I loved, I loved that part. You know, I loved all the deathbed confessions. <laughs> really fun. I didn't actually know what a lot of them would be until I wrote them. You know, I was like, huh, you know, what secrets could be here that I have not completely explored or prepared for? And so that was fun to write. Yeah, and people wondering, uh, well, you know, are her breasts for real? And then you're saying, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we look at them? <laughs> Yeah, it's it was good. Yeah, all of that was fun. Oh, I'm glad you read the book and that you yeah. you have fun with it. Thank really? You. Yeah, I, I just like I always think you know if if I could visualize it and like I could turn that into a movie in my head, then you're doing a really good job at uh, using description, and it's very colorful that way. Thank you. Absolutely, Thank you. I like that little tongue in cheek comment. At least I was wearing nice underwear. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I got that from my uh, my my great aunt Primo, who always told me when I was a little girl, she'd say, "Oh my gosh, I think I put this line in um, uh, for uh, Marilee's mother." Um, she would say, <laughs> <laughs> "Always put on a fresh face of makeup before you go to bed. God forbid there should be a fire." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to think about that. It's you know, it's images everything. Yeah, yeah. Really amazing, though, because, you know, it's really technology that's really changed so much. Like back in the old days of the National Enquirer and stuff like that. Yeah, you'd see that in the supermarket. And now it's everywhere. You got TMZ. It's like, I think they know when we're going to die before you're, you you even know yourself. It's just amazing. Well, it's terrible. And, and, you know, you have only to look at the at Britney Spears and Lindsay Lohan and you know, even to me, who who survived beautifully through all of yeah, that, yeah. but but you have only to look at their their trajectory to see what damage was done. And one of the themes that I really enjoyed wrestling with in this book is what price fame, and and what is the celebrity's responsibility in all of this? What is what is our Not me, because I was never that big star, but what is the accountability to that? At what point is it okay to say, stop looking at me? Stop looking at me. You know, yes, I wanted you to look at me yesterday. Yeah, yeah, you work so hard. Not so much, you know? And, And I really had a good time working with that in Jackie's inner life about her having to wrestle with how how accountable is she for what happened to her? 
And and that was, it, it was more layered than I thought it was when I went into it. You know, I, I just came came to the book with the paparazzi as the enemy, and I hate them. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I found a much deeper well to, to draw from there. But listen, yeah. how happy am I that there were no cell phones when I was a young actress? Oh, right. I can't even imagine yeah. what yeah. would be out there. <laughs> really? Cameras Yay, are everywhere. Lucky me. <laughs> oh my god so true oh. it's become so much harder i mean you work so hard for that fame but then we we all forget in the real world this, these are human beings and yeah. it's really tough that way it really is yeah so, oh and, and you know you look at like you know this this and i think of him as a child justin bieber who was a child yeah. when he became huge and and what they've done to him and how he and, and and how he wrestles with, you know, what he needs from publicity and 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 what he has to avoid in order to stay sane. I mean, it's amazing, you know. Anyway, it really is. So, putting the book together, uh, what was that writing process like? Did you get up in the morning and say, "I'm going to do two hours writing, go out on the beach, uh, go do this, come back"? Was there like a a set schedule for you to do this, and were you just taking notes like all the time, or did you were you able to compartmentalize? <laughs> well, I wish I were that writer, and, <laughs> and one day I aspire to be that writer. <laughs> but I, you know, it was pretty haphazard for me. You know, um, uh, after I start, I started this in a workshop, um, and really, I was learning to write fiction uh, in this workshop with this idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and then I had these children. You know, I, I had more children. I had three little boys uh, wow. under the age of six, oh my. and I realized that they were really inconvenient for writing. And that I had to make a choice <laughs> yeah, whether yeah. to be a mother or to be a writer because because I found myself just resenting them, you know, because I couldn't get that time to, to, to work in my head. And it was different than being an actor on the set, though at the time I was acting as well, you know, where where, you know, I could have them in my dressing room and I'd go to the set and I'd come back and I would nurse. And, you know, there was some, because when you write, you go into this other place in yourself. I, I, I mean, for me, I disappear. You and have to, yeah. Yeah. So, honestly, we well, after we moved up here, and I thought to myself, well, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll quit show business. I'll move up, you know, to this island near Seattle, and, and I'll just write. And I got up here, and I found out that I really just had to parent that that was really what I had to do while I was here, if I wanted to be a good parent. Mm -hmm. And so I put this novel away for 10 years. Mm. And then I came back to it when they were older and could, you know, and didn't want to be around me anymore. (laughs) Right. That happens at a certain (laughs) point. You know, fuck you, mother. (laughs) Time to go back to writing, I guess. (laughs) There's such beautiful little angels, and then, you know, they hit 13, and it's like they want to be in their rooms. (laughs) Truly. I'm like, oh, I'll be out in my office. Thank you very much. (laughs) It's so depressing in that way, right? So, so, you know, that's been my writing process. And, um, And sometimes I'm really disciplined, and sometimes I'm just, you know, fighting to be disciplined. And, and somehow, You know, COVID was very helpful. It got me to really, really sit down and edit with my my editor, Myra, and and get published and really concentrate on nothing else but getting the book out. Yeah, and how important it is to have that editor and to bounce the ideas back and forth so you have something fluid there. That that must be nice. Well, that's, that's my favorite thing. I mean, the only thing I can tell you that I miss about acting is being collaborative. You know, rehearsing yeah. is really fun. And and I found the same energy when I was working with Myra, with my editor. I was so grateful to have somebody point out to me where I needed to go further or where I needed to draw back. And, you know, somebody to get it and to, and to partner with me was just, you know, was a thrilling ride with her. 
Yeah, I would imagine that it is similar to rehearsing in the sense that you're bouncing the ideas off and you're preparing a lot. Yeah, definitely. I remember uh, my sister was in theater. and She was, in fact, in the same theater troupe that Carol Kane was in. Carol Kane was a little older than my sister. Up in in Cleveland, Ohio. And I used to help my sister rehearse for her plays. Yeah, I used to help my mother rehearse when, when I was a little girl. You know, she would have me um, read the other parts. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that's what got you into it. And, you know, obviously you were born into this. So it's like what you know. Yeah. Also, I I literally was not qualified to do anything else. (laughs) (laughs) Just (laughs) born into it. You're soaking in it. And it's just like. I'm sure. Well, you know, I, I was also rather, you know, a juvenile delinquent in my teens and, and perhaps even up and through my early 20s. So, you know, acting suited me perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, between New York and Malibu, I mean, how could you not? I mean, the big playgrounds, how could you not get in trouble in those days? Yeah, it was it was big trouble. It was big <laughs> trouble for sure. What was it like getting into, you know, television and film? I mean, what were your first roles? And uh, how did you feel when you first, like, saw yourself on, on, on the screen? Well, that, 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 so it's two questions. How I felt about seeing myself on the screen is how I still feel, which is, you know, I, I'm always mortified. I always think I look different than what actually appears on the screen, and then I'm like, oh. You know, whose nose is that? And <laughs> why do I, you know what I mean? It's just oh, yeah. it's too self critical. Although I do have to say that now, you know, when I look back at like my character in Greece at Marty, you know, I think, God, I was just adorable. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I feel like I'm looking in third person now because it's been so long. I go, oh, she's so cute. You know, look at, oh, look at her body. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't look at myself, you know. Yeah, that's Um, understandable. It really is. I think a lot of us, and I think that's a human nature kind of thing. It's like, I don't like to hear my voice back. I don't like to see myself back. So a lot of people don't watch it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, what my first role was, Welcome Back, Connor. Yeah. I I was, I went on to to ask Barbara, uh, to ask, um, yeah, Vinny Barbarino, who was John Travolta's character. I asked Barbarino to the dance, and I end up going to ho- with Horshack. That was my first role, and kind of the story of my life. Yeah, you know, I remember that. Yeah. I remember that Sadie Hawkins day, and it's like, yeah, it's like, yes, it's yeah. Oh my god! Oh, I, I, see, I didn't even remember that. <laughs> I remember that episode very well. In fact, I remember when Cotter started. I, I remember yeah. my dad called me. And I was out shoveling snow. He's like, there's this new show. Welcome back, Cotter. And I thought Gabe Kaplan was the most hilarious person I ever saw. Well, I had such a crush on John Travolta before I went on that show that I thought I was going to die. When I, when I actually got hired, I thought, I will not survive this. I mean, I, I don't think I'd ever felt that nervous around anybody in my whole life. Oh, I'm sure at the time, too. He basically yeah. owned the 70s. It was he, like... he, oh, he literally owned the 70s. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Wow. <laughs> and, and then that led to soap. And I remember soap very, very well as a kid. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm, I was so lucky to to be hired for those roles back then. You know, it was, the Soap was another show that I had watched, you know, and was a big fan of before I was hired onto it. I think I came on in the second or third season. I can't remember which season it was, but it was like walking into your, the pages of your favorite book. You know, oh my God, there's Bert, there's Mary, you know, there's <laughs> Danny. You know, I mean, there's a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> I loved shows like that because, like, I was around, you know, that dysfunction in the 70s. And I was like, well, these people are more like us, not like the Cleavers. Like, exactly, they're... <laughs> exactly. It's like, what's so controversial? This is my home. <laughs> exactly. And I remember towards the end of Soap, I remember ABC kind of running this disclaimer, is this show going too far? I'm like, what are they doing wrong here that's offending anybody? I don't care. <laughs> funny isn't it well what we look back on now that you know that 
we have HBO. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and everybody's doing, you know, things I can't say on your show. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, so. <laughs> that is so anyway, true. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, soap was, soap was awesome. That was a, that was a really lucky break. You had you have worked with so many lovely people, but it seemed like Richard Mulligan was like at the top of that list. Top seemed, of the list. Oh, Absolutely. like such a sweetheart, right? Yeah, the, not only a sweetheart, but he defined the word gentleman. Yeah, he was a gentleman, and and he ran. You know, when we did Empty Nest, you know, he was captain of the ship, and he was a gentleman, and he was always prepared. We were watching the bloopers. A couple of months ago, someone sent me a reel of empty nest bloopers. I'd never seen them before. And of course, I'm like up on my lines all the time. I'm forgetting everything. David Leisure is forgetting things. Park Richard never forgets a line. He is, there's no blooper that he's responsible for. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Reel. It's all us screwing up. <laughs> Richard is just like, and the funniest part of the bloopers is just watching him shake his head. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, sigh, there they go again. You know, yeah. it's amazing. Some people just have that photographic memory, and it's like, I cannot believe how they could remember so many lines at once. It's Yeah, well, he, he didn't have a photographic memory, but what he did yeah. was he worked diligently day and night. And he had this, he was so funny. He had this little stamp pad. I've never talked about this. He had a stamp pad and a stamp of a red strawberry. Huh. And every time he would learn a page to where he knew he had it, he'd stamp it with that red strawberry stamp. I have not thought about that until now. That's, That's really interesting. Did. Wow. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah, Empty Nest. It just seemed like a really, really great show. And Christy McNichol was also in that. Uh, yeah. Just a really fantastic actor. Very, yeah, very well. I was, we, we had such fun chemistry together. I mean, when she left the show, you know, I felt, the, I felt like the bottom dropped out for me. It was, you know, I didn't have anyone at the other end of the seesaw. And uh, that was hard, you know. And, um, but she's great. You know, we still, we stay in touch and see each other, you know, every couple of years and she's amazing. Yeah. So much talent around you. Yeah, definitely. Another one that comes to mind. I went to see Ordinary People. My mother took me to Ordinary People. I must have been 12 when that came out. Wow. And I was yeah. like floored. It was just so intense. And I was like, yeah. this, this is Mary Richards? What? <laughs> she's like, this I is know. so different. <laughs> what happened to her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, her shadow self. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I first like realized, wow, people can really have a serious range and take on wildly different characters. Yeah, yeah. That was that was career defining for her. You know, she I don't even know that she knew she had that in her. Yeah, it seems like people who have been in comedy can make that transition to to acting, intense acting, and do it well. I remember Bill Murray was one of those who could mm-hmm. really, really just transfer it over and just floor you with their acting chops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think probably easier from comedy to drama than from drama to comedy, because comedy, it, comedy really can't be learned. You yeah. know what I mean? It's so tough. You either have you either have a funny bone or you don't. And 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 I have really seen that, you know, particularly when I was directing uh, uh, where you really couldn't teach anybody how to spin the joke. They either knew how to do it or not. And you could help them spin it better, but but you can't make someone funny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's so true. You can't just learn it. And you could do improv workshops and things like that. But there are people who are just, you know, you're born funny. It's like you you just see it. Um, You look at somebody like Robin Williams. I saw him live in concert once, very up close. And you just laugh. You just see the person and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I did an episode of Mark and Mindy. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I was really, um, I'm really lucky that I had that, you know, that I got to rub elbows, really, with with that genius, e- even though I was, you know, out of my mind at the time. And he was out of his mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, we rubbed our, but we rubbed our elbows anyway. <laughs> I know, gosh, I, you know, to have that kind of thing on your back and to constantly deal with it for so many years, it's just, uh, yeah, you could feel that with somebody like that. But yeah, he was really incredible. When I saw him, it was a few weeks after John Belushi died. So I don't think he was in such a good place at that moment, but still funny though. He was, it was at a benefit I saw. So these days, uh, are you still teaching acting? Are you doing, uh, it's something I, I came across that you were the founder of the Northwest Actors Lab. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, well, I did that for, oh gosh, when we first moved up here, um, I was uh, teaching um, teaching at our little theater here, um, Bainbridge Performing Arts, which is a great, great little theater. And um, um, and so I started North, Northwest Actors Lab, but then um, I began teaching at a women's prison, not far from where we live, and that uh, that became my passion. And so up until COVID, I was teaching uh, improv and acting there with a friend of mine, uh, Michelle Allen. And we would go in every week, and we were part of their high school 21 program. We were their drama credit. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it, was, it was wonderful. I have not been able to go back since COVID, unfortunately. They have not let us back in. Uh, but um, we started uh, not just a theater arts program there, but also a writer's program and an art program in their high school 21 program. So that was very rewarding for me. Yeah. And, and such a blast. I mean, boy, those those women are, are really something. I've learned a lot from them. Yeah, it must feel good to give back. I think a lot of us who get into arts and entertainment feel like, you know, it's just so rewarding beyond doing the work and people seeing what you do. It's just, it feels so good to be on the ground level and to really just feel like you're really, you know, contributing to society. Um, well, I don't know that it was that uh, that unselfish of me, uh, frankly, at the time. Um, at the time, I needed them more than they needed me. I, yeah. had, uh, I had lost a child, and uh, mm. my son Dashiell was killed in a car accident uh, five years ago. Oh, my gosh. And I, so I was gutted. I was completely, yeah. completely gutted, and... At a certain point, I knew that in order for me to be able to function, just to get up, um, I had to give myself a purpose. And I felt like I couldn't be around anybody who was happy. <laughs> was yeah, I could understand I that after that. Yeah, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be around people who weren't suffering. And yeah. so I had this idea to go into the system, into the um, correction system. And they, you know, I went and pitched my class to the, to the head of the department and they took it and literally those women saved me. I did not save them. Mm. You know, they were all like, what the, (laughs) what am I doing in an acting class? (laughs) (laughs) Who is this lady who says she was one of the pink ladies? I'm not sure I believe her. (laughs) And, And for me, it was the only place that I felt safe and that I, where I laughed. And I laughed and laughed and laughed myself well mm. with them. And so that's the, tr- the, the real true story of you know, yeah. why I went in to do that work. Well, that's really cool. So in the future, do you, do you want to get back into acting? Or... Uh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Not at all? Not, even if there's oh, a no, great no, part no. for you? Go back to, I want to go back to the prison, but I don't want to Not back to acting, back. not back to Hollywood. It's, it's oh, over. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Dear, I, <laughs> I don't want to be nervous anymore. Really, know? it's too much. It's too much ner- too much anxiety for me around it. You yeah, know? I can't metabolize it anymore. That kind of nervousness. 
Yeah. I just can't. It's I don't want to worry about what I look like or if people are going to, you know, people hmm. are going to think I'm good or if I'm going to get fired or if I'm going to get hired. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, yeah, definitely paid your dues. There's no, no, no question about that with the, the filmography. It's just amazing. And you've also gotten into a lot of directing. Uh, uh, what was it like, you know, taking on that role as director, like for uh, uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch? That was terrible. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, right. that's the truth. Yeah. Um, that was pretty terrible. It was really great when I was directing Empty Nest. Because yeah. I had so much support. The crew were so supportive of me. They held me. They carried me. Anything I didn't know, they came up with for me. And I was allowed to learn on the job. Um, and then I went out into the real world. And boy, they were mean out there. Oh, my. Mean. God. And nobody was rooting for me. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my God. So it was... It Uh. was really, really hard. And I was not used to, um, I was not used to taking orders that way. You know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. I had come from a very collaborative set. And then I went on to sets where they were like, do this, do it this way, and have it done. And quite frankly, I don't have that nature. Yeah. just... And I learned that. I mean, I learned that I don't Mm. work and play well with others under those circumstances. And I bit back. And you just don't bite back. (laughs) Yeah. Well, nobody likes being micromanaged. Yeah. It's like, who? Yeah. It it just, it it was not a, it's not a creative experience for me. And so, um, so it was a mutual divorce um, of directing television in Hollywood. I, I just, I just don't have the chops for it. I don't have the, the, you know, I, nothing bounces off of me that way. I, I, I'm not cut out for it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's part of life too. You just, you have the good experiences, the bad experiences. You, you take it all and you, you keep moving on. And now that you're into writing, which is just seems a lot more doable and a lot more of a sane life, I'm sure. I have a very sane life. Yeah. yeah. And, and I and I really, you know, work to keep it that way. You know, I I am um, I love living in the Northwest. Um, I I, uh, I I hope to spend less winters here because oh, really? it's pretty dreary up here. But um, but I love my community. I have an amazing community. You know, I, I've got an amazing husband, and I have horseback riding, which I'm is my hobby passion. And, um, you know, I'm, I live a very, you know, uneventful, uh, rewarding life, truly. Yeah, yeah, it sounds bucolic, relaxing, especially with the horses. I know a lot of people do therapy with horses. Yeah, and, uh, well, you know, I'm not a relaxed person, so I need to build relaxation around me so that... <laughs> You know, truly, I mean, I I have to make my life um, that way in order for me not to be, you know, bouncing off the walls like like being inside a pinball machine. You know what I mean? I can be very reactive. So so I I have a, a pretty a pretty cool existence here. Great. And you still keep in touch with everybody, you know, not everybody, but like a certain amount of people you've known in the business, which kind of keeps you connected in that sense, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I have a, and I have a tribe, you know, I I mean, you know, my mother, who who is Lee Grant, is still alive and kicking. She's 96 and she lives in Manhattan. And, you know, I get to go and see her and be in fabulous dinner parties and go to the theater and you know, I get all the best of the business now, really. You know, I have, you know, lots of friends who are still working. And, and um, the, the T-Birds and the Pink Ladies, we all keep in touch. We're, we do some autograph shows together. Christy and I and David keep in touch, you know, from Empty Nest. And, you know, I, 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 can, I can visit. You know, it's like showbiz is a nice place to visit, but I don't want to live there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like that one. That's exactly what I do, you know. (laughs) You know, I I go to my mom's and, you know, there's just, you know, most amazing people at the dinner table, you know, 
Yeah. The yes Men and Brenda Vaccaro and Alan Alda. And, I love those so, people. I mean, like, it, I, I feel, you know, like, blessed to be in their presence. And then I come home. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's just so awesome. Just to sit down yeah, with Alan cool. all <laughs> those wonderful I know, people. I, know. I, uh, would say I was I was in a, I was a little intimidated, I have to say. Oh yeah, but you know, then you get to, you know, you go below that surface and it's, you know, you have a good conversation with somebody like that. I would think somebody like yeah. Alan Alda is wonderful. Yeah, there's nothing like a good dinner party of, you know, all the people you ever fantasized, you know, splitting a, a loaf of bread with. Oh. What a dream. What a dream. What a dream. What a dream. You are living it. Well, that's great. So more writing in the future? Are you going to have your autobiography out one day? I never will write an autobiography. <laughs> Let somebody else never. do it? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, you know. You know, who cares? <laughs> but, and I, I, I don't like, um, I love listening to people's memoirs. I, I'm bored with my own story. You know, I'm much sure. more interested in what I can pick and choose from it to, to weave into something else. Um, so, yes, I'm still writing. I have another piece that I'm starting to play with. Good. Um, I'm going to record the audible version of Jackie Gold in January, and that'll be out probably by March. And, and um, you know, I'm passionate about getting readership for this book because this, I think it's a really fun entertaining story and you know I, I think of it as like a serious beach read you know like yes. like it's you take it to the beach and go oh this is deeper than i thought you know but, <laughs> but it's still really yeah. entertaining you know and so you know right now i'm just concentrated on on uh expanding the readership excellent Excellent. Well, starting with you. Yeah, <laughs> I will get that word out there. Definitely. Okay. Thank I just you. fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, definitely get this new book. We'll have that on Audible soon. We'll yes, hear from the you real on true that. Hollywood story of Jackie Gold. You can get it on Amazon. You can request it at your local bookstore if you want to bypass Amazon. Or you can get it on my website, dynamanoff.org. There's a link there to it as well. So. Awesome. There you have it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Take care Thanks, and Robert. best wishes. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.